Hello, everybody. So today I'm going to have a presentation about a topic that might be interesting to some of you. All right. So before we go down, let's go to data sharing. Sorry, not data sharing, screen sharing. So I'm going to share the keynote thing. All right. So today the topic I'm going to talk about or maybe share about with the folks here is actually talk about like open source solutions for the big data challenges, right? Now, this is the uh, theme statement for the presentation. So in this modern world of business, right, so data management has become the crucial, critical challenge to overcome, especially for companies inside the Red Sea, right? So if you do actually invest in something called data management, eventually you might change the company's face from zero to hero, right? So the important theme here is actually talking about inside this new modern business world. Data is, of course, everywhere. But the important thing is how to make use of it. So to make use of it, we use a term data management. Right? So we're talking about the differences between data collection and data management and so on. And also, where are you now? Are you somewhere in the management pipeline or actually still in the collection pipeline? Now, these are some of the genders that we're going to cover. All right? So we'll talk about what's the difference between data collection and data management. And if you've got data on hand, what should you do? Or what can you do? Of course, we talk about the costing of maintaining the management and its pipeline, the process. And, um, and then once we got all the things here, we should pre-send them, right? So that's when we do storytelling. So there's also a demonstration here, a 10 to a roughly 10 minutes demonstration. And I actually have videotaped it already. So in case we do not have enough time, we can still read the presentation. And the last thing is the FAQ, right? Question time and so on. Okay, so now who's talking? So my name is Jason. I came from the company called Elastic, right? And my position is actually something called Education Architect. Pretty weird, right? So what I, do I do? So daily, I, do, I run trainings. I do curriculum development, all right? So the trainings and the curriculum for Elastic Stack actually is one of the contributors in general. I do a lot of prototyping too. So that means simply coding sample projects, right? And they're useful because I need to present these prototypes in meetups and also for my technical blocks. So that's why I still do a lot of coding, even though now I'm kind of like doing trainings for most of the time. So the two box, I used to be Java developer, writing Java backend systems for a lot of big corporates and uh, also solution architect, those kind of thing, all right? Actually, system architect instead of solution architect. But anyways, pretty much the same thing. So for the recent years, I actually went, uh, I mean, kind of like transited from backend developers to something what we call DevOps, which means simply one man behind. You need to finish the backend, the front end, the database level, or the data level, that kind of thing. So that's why I kind of like shift to Go language and NIM as the backend, um, backend development language here, all right, because they're fast and also native bound, right? And for the uh, front end, I kind of like switched to JavaScript in general. So you can see a lot of React.js, Vue, Note, Angular, and so on, right? So if you also got the, these kind of, um, or maybe share these kinds of skill sets and you want to kind of like have further discussions with me and so on, feel free to, right? So for the demonstration and the information's here, um, this is the GitHub, all right? So this is the GitHub for the, the demonstration later on. And you will get back all the scripts there as well. All right, so take a look if you have time. And you can actually take photos, et cetera. Um, and also, we actually have provided a blog for the, this demo as well. So even though I'm going to do the demonstration, but if you prefer mod on reading text instead of uh, watching videos, feel free to go to this blog on Medium. And for the rest of these social media information, if you want to connect with me, always find me on LinkedIn. And also, if you want to get back the source code for various projects and related things, go to the GitHub, okay? I'm going to use the Quo Master. And for Medium and WordPress, yes, I write technical blocks. Uh, and the future direction is I'm going to have all my blocks migrated to Medium. So WordPress will kind of like have nothing to do later on, all right? Twitter, I seldom go there, but actually I have an account. So that's why I'm still kind of listing that here. 
All right, so feel free to take a look on those resources. Now, the first thing, the first agenda, where are we now? Are we doing data collection or actually doing data management? To be honest, data collection simply means getting data from various sources with nearly no processing. All right, so it's just like getting the audit logs from Windows systems and throw it to a repository. And of course, above it should be a kind of like system that we can actually search and retrieve this information. But remember, we didn't do any processing, right? So it's just kind of like a database. You search for a particular uh, audit log, you get it back, done, nothing else. So not much value in it, all right? So when we're talking about data management, we of course will collect the data, but we also do processing on them. And later on, we do data liberalization, which means that we will make the data live, live, so that we can present the data in a more fancy way, interesting way. Right? So that means data management is a process, a step, a pipeline. All right? So it's very different from just collecting them. So some brain teasers. So we've got three scenarios. What do you think these scenarios represent? Is it collection or just management? First one, collecting logs from different internal systems and treat them as all the logs. This is collection because there is no extra value extracted from these data set collected. Second one, generating trend analysis on granted loans to SMEs in Singapore. This one, this is data management because we have trend analysis. It's not just collecting data, the number of uh, amount of money we granted to SMEs, but also we have a trend analysis. So we can kind of like predict what will happen for the next three months or next year, all right? Value added. Next thing, discovering the relationships between savings and your occupation. Again, this is not just collecting, but also data management because we do analysis. And so for banks or financial institutes, they actually can use this information to kind of like predict what will happen in the economy for the next quarter. For example, COVID-19, right? We know that lots of uh, business and countries actually got locked down. And so probably savings occupations and the trends and so on, they might not go well. They might be flat if we're fortunate. They might even go a slum, all right? So these are some of the things that we might be able to discover if we have the data there, all right? So value added. So now what can we do with the data on hand then? Because you know, a lot of clients from my trainings actually have told me that, yeah, well, the clients from us is like, um, because they're service providers, they said that, oh, the clients just want us to store those logs there and that's it. We can do nothing or we have nothing to do. All right, so in general, what can we do? Well, usually we can do analytics. So either by manual way, that is find an analyst to do these kind of an analytical jobs, or maybe we can find somebody to create a machine learning model so that we can learn these things without using any human inputs, all right? So two ways of an analytics, one is human or manual performed, one is machine learning performed. We can also do a storytelling based on all these data set we collected. <clears throat> this is actually important because the next step, if we can do a storytelling, we can guide the management on decision making as well. For example, the trend analysis on certain things can actually help the management to have a real idea of what is really happening inside this business world. Also, we can discover the behavior and the stickiness by using regression analysis. For example, when we talk about something like um, the spending related to your salary, related to your living area. So actually these things can be done through regression analysis, right? So once we discovered the behavior, we can kind of like create some uh, tailor-made projects or campaigns to focus on that particular group of people, right? So actually, it's useful, value added. <clears throat> so the cost of maintaining the data management. The first thing is open source and the commercial source, commercial source data. Oh, sorry, not data, products. So like the theme set, uh, we're talking about how the open source projects and software is going to help to solve the big data challenges, right? So you can see, of course, open source will have a common rival called commercial products. So you can see Elastic is somewhere here in the middle. So it's actually kind of like free and not free. 
So if you actually just don't need the support from Elasticsearch, the company, you can use Elastic Stack for free, okay? But usually you buy the support if you're actually running Elastic Stack in some production environment, I guess, right? So that's why I would say it's a yes, on, yes and no scenario. So it's an open source product, but you can also make it commercial if you buy the subscriptions, right? So similar things happened in the field as well. So you can see with Splunk, that is a completely commercial product that works very similar to Elastic Stack in general. Oracle has its own suite to handle the data management processes and solutions, etc. cetera. Logarithm, Datadog are very similar to Elastic as well. And they are actually SaaS, uh, SaaS. So it's kind of like software as a service or software as a plat platform as a service, those kind of things, right? Hadoop is also one of the yes and no scenario. So it's open source for sure, but for production environment, you probably would buy the license and make it commercial, right? So same case. So this is the variations, the options you can get to manage a data management system. Now the MIPS, lots of MIPS, right? Um, we see that open source is crap. Uh, that's not true, all right? So for example, um, we have a lot of very nice um, open source projects. For example, Hadoop is actually one of them. Elasticsearch is one of them. Kafka is also one of them and so on. So there are lots of very well produced open source products. And to be honest, even though you might think that open source is not kind of a reliable, many banking, many banks and financial institutions and even governments are actually using open source products at their back end. So it's true. So, well, I can't disclose the name though, but you can see in Singapore, some of the banks, the bigger ones, are already using Elastic Stack at the back. And also some of the, uh, some of the commercial products like uh, the, the, what, the, something similar to Uber, right? So we have something similar in Uber in, in Singapore, like called Grab and so on. So these kind of companies also make use of Elasticsearch for searching and also for geolocation related search, all right? <clears throat> so that's the case. <clears throat> so open source is not really crap. It depends on how the owner of the product or project runs this, this thing, all right? So it's just like commercial products. Commercial products also have crap things. So it depends on how that company is going to run that project or product, all right? So that's why it's a myth. Right? No such thing as open source must be crap. Right? So support is limited on the open source products. Again, it's a myth. Um, if you look into Elasticsearch, right, we have very good documentations for the public. So this is also kind of support. And also, if you actually um, don't want to buy support and you still want to get consultation for free, we, well, I mean for Elasticsearch itself, we already maintained a forum for doing so. So you can always post your questions there and the developers, engineers, and also the support team will actually take a look at that and give you some directions. So of course, it's not 100% guaranteed that um, you'll get what you want, but at least we give you directions on how to solve the problem. Remember, it's free, come on, all right? So no guarantee on some of the things, of course. Okay, the next myth, a team of 100 versus the collaborations of talents. So uh, people will say that um, commercial products are better because we have 100 smart brains working on that particular commercial product. Well, that is a true and false thing again. So think about this way. For open source like Elasticsearch, we have so many contributors from the public. So over thousands of contributors. If um, if 50% of those thousands of contributors are also smart brains, just like those team of hundreds, then probably I can tell you that actually the quality, the idea, the capability of those open source projects is not worse than a team of hundred. Actually, it should be much better. All right. So think about this way. If you work in a company, so your ideas, your imaginations will be kind of like bound by the company structure and management. But for open source, we're actually very open spirit. So if you have something good, something fancy, some good ideas, feel free to contribute and maybe discuss with the group of people maintaining this open source project. So if your idea is actually a good one, adopt it, hey, you actually just contribute a new feature, right? So 
this is a myth, right? No such thing as 100 brains must be better than the talents in the public. And also with so many talents inside this computing world. So that's why it's a myth. All right, the last point, the open source company behind is not stable before or after the IPO. <clears throat> now this is an interesting thing because Elasticsearch actually gone through this, all right? We just IPO like last year, I guess, last year or last year and a half. Interesting thing is, um, before we actually go to IPO, uh, some of the markets will feel that um, the company is not stable. Maybe tomorrow they will collapse and so on. So that is the reason why they don't want to buy the license and so on. Uh, actually, it's a myth because um, it really depends on how the owner of the project, the company, actually runs this, this company. All right? If they runs this company well, like what we did, actually, before, after IPO, it's the same. We're still very stable. We still have a lot of support to the users that adopted our products, right? So that's why it's a myth. And on the other hand, commercial companies that also go into IPO might also collapse, right? So there's no guarantee that if you are kind of like a public company, you will always be success. So no such thing. So that's why it's a myth. All right, so the course of your data management team. The first thing is you need to have a team of people to handle these five things. So we need a team of people that can integrate data source into our data management system because the data source may be from database, you need to talk of it, from APIs or from just CSV files. The next thing is we need a team of people to do some process and cleaning, cleansing of data because the data you get back might be not in a uniform format. So we need to kind of like, um, like for example, we got CSV, we got XML data set. We need to convert them into a format that is acceptable by your data management system. So you need a team of people to do that. Next thing is to apply the analytics, either a manual way to the machine learning way. So again, you need people to program these things beforehand. Next thing is how to generate visualizations on storytelling. If you not have a tool to do that, you will need a programmer to code the visualizations. Like for example, using graph.js, raffle.js, and so on. Or maybe you have crystal reports. You need somebody to create a report, right? So this is the case of visualization thing. And of course, last point is how to house skip your data, all right? So old data, you need to house skip them, you need to archive, backup, and so on. So PS, a good tool stack would actually reduce all these costs mentioned. Now the process pipeline. So you can see actually it's the previous five steps. We do the integration, we do the cleansing, we do analysis, we generate reports, and of course, housekeep. So each of the steps, how can we fulfill it in, for example, Elastic Stack? In Elastic Stack, the first step is talking about something what we call um, collecting and integrating data. So in this case, we use Logstash, which is an ETL2. So you see, we can actually have input from different sources, like from standard in, and then we pump the data into a filter transformer so that we can transform them by using like Brock, regular expression, adding some data from GeoIPs and extract the browser agent data from user agent plugin and so on. And finally, we output the data to somewhere, maybe Elasticsearch or just a flat file, all right? So that is how we handle step one, if you're using Elasticsearch. Of course, if you're using some other products, there might be something similar as well. Step two, the cleansing. Multiple approaches. So we can use it, use a program to do the uh, cleaning beforehand. You can use tools like Logstash that we just mentioned earlier to do the cleansing, or maybe you can use some server side uh, products to do that. Like for example, Elasticsearch have ingest notes, which is something that we can create an ingest pipeline, all right? So this is the pipeline, kind of like a script. And so every document that comes in will go through this script and do a cleansing operation. Right. Step three, the analysis. So remember, analysis can be done through manually or machine learning level. So for Elastic Stack, we provide Kibana and machine learning tools here. Like for example, this is actually a tool called machine learning inside the Kibana. So we can use this tool or app to actually find out the trend analysis and also some abnormal activities. For example, the red ones here means that at this moment of time, these things are actually abnormal, all right? Step four, we talk about data liberalization through the visualizations. So usually we need a BI2 for that, 
and uh, you can pay for it or you can use the open source version. So this is the Kibana dashboard that we provided, totally free. Okay, yes, totally free. So of course, uh, a free BI2 would not be 100% super useful sometimes, all right? But it's actually already feature reached, right? <clears throat> and the interesting thing is there will be some limitations for sure because we're not 100% working on this kind of visualization platform. We're not like uh, companies like Grafana or Tableau in which they actually focus 100% on visualization. So of course, in some ways, we have some limitations, right? Compared with them. And commercial products usually will have more support on the visualization types and also able to integrate to different data sources as well. But to be honest, if you actually do not want to pay an open source products like Kibana to, and also the Elastic Stack is actually quite good enough, right? Featureized. Step five is housekeeping. So again, lots of ways, all right? Um, when we talk about housekeeping, it's like archiving data, backupping data, uh, restore the data, et cetera, those kind of things. So many ways. So Elastic Stack provides uh, basically something called index lifecycle management. So we can create policy so that we know uh, the index, data index, when they are old enough, we will kind of like uh, do archiving and maybe backup and so on. So another way is to use the curator Python client, which is actually doing the same thing, but you need to kind of like use uh, some cron jobs to kind of like regularly run these, run these tasks, right? Storytelling. So why is it important for storytelling? Because you want to retrieve the hidden values inside your data set, right? You've got so many data, but it's very boring to just present them in spreadsheets, right? So instead, you need something more vivid a graph or inter interactivities, right? So the kind of thing. And also the second big point, data collected from customers reveal their behavior truth. So those, there's no way to lie. So think about this way. If I'm giving you a survey now, um, asking you a question, did you buy something for your wife within this year, like perfumes and so on? Then what you do is like, you're scratching your head and it's trying to recall from your memory. Did I actually buy something for my wife? Oh, if you did, good. If you didn't, ha <laughs> you're in big trouble. All right, so you're trying to kind of like retrieve the memory. So, you know, sometimes when we retrieve the memory, it's not 100% accurate. So you might say, yes, I did. Actually, you didn't, right? Or maybe the other, way, the other way around. So now the case is, if we actually got back all the data from your buying behavior, for example, I'm working in a bank, I get back all your credit card transactions, right? Throughout this year. I can actually do a filtering and find out, oh, you actually bought something that is related to females instead of for male. Then probably they are related to your wife, maybe, all right? So that means there is no way to lie. Even though through your memory, the big memory, you said that you didn't buy anything, but actually we found out that you did buy something, all right? So that is the point here. So based on the truth data set we get, we can actually predict the sales or do some campaigns related to a particular group much more accurately, all right? Because these are the true data, all right? Now, the next thing is storytelling or storyteller. Is it a good job? So these are some interesting facts I've done. If you go to Indeed or maybe jobstreet.com, just type in storyteller and see here, you actually got back quite a number of jobs as well, right? So that means storytelling is actually not too bad. And also a lot of uh, non-technical users like business analysts and so on, or maybe product managers or project managers, um, they're actually also storytellers, right? So how to tell your story nicely. If you actually have the data presented in the correct way, of course, it's better to tell the story. If not, for example, you only got Excel spreadsheet. Come on, this is so boring. Even though you can tell the story very vividly, it's still boring. But on the visualization part, if you provide the same thing here with a graph like this, to be honest, it's much more better, all right? It's not so boring. And you can even hoover on it and have some interactivity. Wow, that's a plus, all right? So even though you have the technique, you still need tools to assist you to make the story better. All right, so that's the point. So want to learn more? If you actually want to learn more about the Elastic Stack, so today the demonstration, we're talking about the exact stack here. 
So we're talking about how to use file piece to ingest the data and then go to Elasticsearch and finally go to Keybonnet to visualize the thing. You can actually take a look on this link, training Elastic CO, and then you will see that we have a lot of trainings talking about how to use uh, all the tools within the Elastic stack, including machine learning as well. You also can pay attention to something called certified engineer. So you need to take an exam and you get certified. Uh, in US, in the States, um, certified engineers actually got a better job, that's true. Um, but for Asia, not a big trend yet. But uh, it's true that if you actually have a certified certified um, certification granted or earned it, actually you should get a job easier, plus also having some bargaining powers on getting a better salary. So again, recap on the resources of the demonstration. These are the links that we get back uh, that actually supports the demonstration later on, plus also the blog version, and also the social media that you can kind of like ping me on. And before we go to the FAQ, let's go to a demonstration, okay?